Yeah, so I have spent uh, the last couple of years uh, focusing on all different kinds of theories of consciousness, um, not trying to judge among them, but just try to get a sense of the vastness of the different kinds of theories and then how they may articulate together in some kind of, uh, of taxonomy. Uh, you have made the point in, in, uh, in your work and in several important papers that the field of consciousness studies should be open to uh, other kinds of data, particularly parapsychological and altered states of, of consciousness theory. So from that perspective, and looking at the whole field of consciousness studies today as expressed in, in the conferences, associations, journals, uh, what's your assessment of yes. the field? I have been recently, because I am the incoming editor of a journal, Psychology of Consciousness, looking at different scholars who could be in the editorial board. And I can be very pleasantly surprised just to find out how many new young researchers and centers are unashamedly uh. titling themselves, advertising themselves as interested in consciousness, in altered states or non-ordinary states. Back when I was starting, I was very much one of very few people not many were willing to risk their lives or at least their professional lives doing that. Right now, it's fashionable to do that. <laughs> With that, though, comes some risks. Uh, one of the risks is that m some of the people I'm talking about have been trained as neuroscientists. And they end up seeing everything they are doing according to the lens of the techniques they have learned. So yeah, sure. sometimes when they are trying to, for instance, do research on a mystical state or visionary states, they are interested in looking at what their analysis of voxels in, a, in an fMRI look like, <laughs> what are the statistics, and they completely forget or close to completely disregard what is the meaning, what is the experience for the person. Uh, to comb and, and of course, there is the other side when a person might just be completely disinterested in possible neurological correlates. But I think a good way to try to integrate at least some of these two aspects is to have what a number of us have been working on for years, which is called a neurophenomenological aspect. Yes. It's not the cure-all, because in addition to the neurophenomenological aspect, one can think about the philosophical perspective, the historical perspective, the cultural perspective on the same experience. So again, there are many different valid perspectives, but talking just about psychology and the neuroscience, uh, the, the neurophenomenological view wants to give equal, equal weight to phenomenal or experiential reports and their neural correlates, not one over the other. I, and I think that's a, a very innovative approach uh, from Fisco Viola, Evan Thompson, mm -hmm. there are many people who've uh, developed that. Um, and, and I've been interested that th they still take a very materialistic view. It doesn't, it, when you say a neurophenomenological, that does not mean that you're, you, you must go outside of, of materialism or physicalism. It's just a, a different way of appro approaching it. Uh, so I, I think uh, from my understanding of uh, neurophenomenology in that approach, it, it, it asks richer and more sophisticated questions, but it doesn't go further than that. It says we should study, but there doesn't seem to be ways to do it. And you're absolutely right. And I would say, well, let me add then the neurophenomenological, the philosophical, the historical, the cultural, and the parapsychological, okay. at <laughs> least. And I may be, must be forgetting a few of those. <laughs> right, right, but right. yes, you should be able to do all of those. Because also, for example, when you do neurophenomenology, you are not doing a cultural historical analysis of why this person in this laboratory is when taking ayahuasca, <laughs> seeing gigantic snakes. <laughs> maybe it is just a drug, but maybe it is just partly based on the fact that people have been hearing about, reading, knowing that in order to do ayahuasca, that comes from the Amazonian, 
that there are wild beasts, that in order to do something dangerous, you may, be able, you may have to face a very dangerous and scary creature such as a snake. <laughs> See, and all of those are also very important aspects. Mm. So the neurophenomenology is, let's say, trying to at least come with the yeah, more agree. psychological and the more neuroscientific, but you should always want to add more. And if they are good analysis, they are good uh, discussions, they will add to whatever you have encountered before. Do you see the field moving in that direction, be more willing to, to accept uh, these different approaches? Uh, well, I do not believe in the field. I believe in individuals. And I think most individuals know their terrain very well. Well, at least the best ones. Some are just mediocre and don't know very well <laughs> what they're doing. But let's say the best ones know their specialties very well and do not adventure far away to other perspectives. Uh, and I think that is something that is unavoidable. And you then need someone who comes up and say, let's do multidisciplinary perspectives. Uh, some years ago, I co-edited two books, Altering Consciousness, and our perspective, Michael Winkleman was a co-editor, was let's see what altered, alternate states have been good for in sociology and mm -hmm. in religion and in psychology and in drug studies and in a few others and in clinical psychology and in literature and in visual arts. And we got good chapters for a vast amount of topics. Now, to be honest, I, of course, read all of the chapters many times and they all enriched me. Do I believe that most professional readers will read mm. all of the papers and think about it? No, mm. but that is what it is. We are limited in different ways. So I think the field is, has progressed insofar as this is not longer, at least the fact of altered state, a, a kind of decision that will damn you to have <laughs> no good profession or no good position mm. in your future. Uh, but it does not mean that you are going to have a vast mind like some of the ones we have had in the past. This morning, I went to see the Leonardo da Vinci exhibit. What do we have here? A person who was extraordinary, one of the best painters in history, plus a sculptor, plus a musician, mm -hmm. plus an inventor, mm -hmm. plus a few other things that are a, a writer, plus a few other things that I am missing. So every once in a while, we need some people like that who tells us, hey, this is interconnected. This is not something that you can just uh, close it within a small cupboard, but rather it's something that should be open because there are many cupboards and there are butterflies and snakes mm. and dragons coming from all of them. And this is the kind of zoo that mm -hmm. we have when dealing with consciousness.